Good evening. It's good to see everyone tonight. We appreciate you being here on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Thankful for your presence. We have a number of visitors with us this evening, and we're grateful for you being here. And all of our members who are here, we're thankful for that opportunity. It's great to be able to have our family together, and we're looking forward to another great lesson in our summer series tonight. In just a few minutes, Brother Steve Harless will be leading us in a song, and then Brother Lonnie Jones will be uh, leading an opening prayer for us in just a minute. We're glad to have tonight, speaking in our summer series, Brother Paul Sane. I believe this is the first time Brother Paul has spoken here, at least while I've been here at uh, Maysville. We're thankful for him being here. He and Robert Hatfield, who will be here later in the year, whom you also know as uh, Emily Morgan's, uh, formerly Morgan, now Hatfield, uh, his husband, and uh, they share uh, pulpit responsibilities and other duties at the East Hill Congregation in Pulaski, Tennessee. And uh, Paul has been there for some 26 years. He and his wife, LaDon, are with us tonight, and uh, she's going to wave so you know where she's at, over here by Miss Betty. We're glad that she's with us tonight. They have four j children, two grandchildren, seven grandchildren, sorry, working the wrong way, seven grandchildren, and uh, other details that he would like to present to you, he can. He is heavily involved in uh, book publication, also in videotaping, uh, lectureships and programs around and through the Brotherhood, and uh, probably lots of other things that I don't know about. But we're glad to have him with us tonight. Um, his topic is uh, a challenging Old Testament story, and I'll let him do that introduction in just a few minutes. We're glad to have Brother Paul with us. So take your Bibles, or take your songbook, and join us in singing. And uh, then Brother Jones will lead us in prayer. And then Brother Paul Sane will deliver the lesson of the hour. Steve? Two hundred forty two, number two forty two. Sing the first and third verse. <clears throat> we read of a place that's called heaven, it's made for the pure and the free. These trusts in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair heaven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Pure waters of life there are flowing, and all who drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair heaven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you allow us to have another day to complete our activities and to come at the close of the day to study from your word. Father, we ask your blessings on Brother Sane as he talks to us about a lesson from the book of Judges, about transitions. Father, we ask that you guide his words and help us to take something in our lives that we can apply and become better people. Father, please bless those in our congregation who are suffering those who are sick or those who are discouraged or afraid. Father, be with those who've lost loved ones. Father, we want you to please be with our sister Annie Ruth as she makes a transition to move out to California with her daughter. Help that to go smoothly and well and give her many years there and help her to be blessed in what she does and thank you for the encouragement she's been to so many throughout the years. Father, we ask your special blessings upon our eldership 
as they continue to lead us and guide us. Help them always to help us to do things that will lead us to be stronger spiritually and strengthen our unity. Father, we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The introduction was more than sufficient, but probably was not as good as what a little five-year-old boy did about 40 years ago. That particular Sunday morning, I saw Philip coming down the aisle. I squatted down and I said, Hey, Philip, how are you? He said, You've got a pug nose and a big mouth. And he just kept right on walking. He had it right. I mean, that's the best introduction I think I've ever had. It is an honor to be here tonight and a joy. And yes, I could talk about all seven grandchildren and children and things of that nature. It's hard to get stopped, though, once you start. And I'm excited, even though we've been involved in publishing work for about 40 some odd years, we publish about 70 to 75 books a year at same publications for the Brotherhood, lectureships, things of that nature, but that's not why we're here either. I'm also involved in Gospel Broadcasting Network, love that work, think it's one of the greatest things that has come along in recent years as far as the potential is concerned, and yet I can't get off on that because I'd spend all of the time there as well. If you don't get gospel broadcasting, you have not familiar with it, go to gbntv.org on your computer and you can listen 24-7 to that and be able to pick up devotional time, lesson times, study times, things of that nature, and some of it has actually been produced there in Pulaski. She was shopping and she decided she wanted some ice cream. She looked up and there was a Baskin Robin. She went inside and she ordered a couple of scoops of uh, butter pecan and was waiting for uh, the, to be served to her. And about that time she looked immediately to her right and she saw her favorite movie star right beside her. Her knees kind of buckled. She thought, what in the world am I going to do? She fidgeted, got the money out, paid, walked outside, realized she didn't have her ice cream. She said, what am I going to do? Well, I've got to go back inside. She went back inside, started back inside. Just as she started through the door, she ran, not straight into him. He said, are you looking for your ice cream? She said, yes. He said, it's in your purse with your change. <laughs> she forgot why she went in there. While we could talk about a lot of different things tonight, We've got to make sure we don't forget why we're here. Our purpose of stopping from our frantic days and activities is to open the Bible and study together. And I'm excited as I look at on your bulletin board and see the ones that you've already studied as well as the additional ones coming up. And I know that it's going to be a great series all the way through. I'm going to tell you up front tonight, there's no way that I can possibly look at all of the material that we find in the book of Joshua and Judges. We see that transition that's being made. I invite you to turn into the book of Joshua in your Old Testament, and we're going to be trying to cover, to some degree of definition of cover, 24 chapters, and then we'll edge on into the book of Judges a little bit, and we'll see a transition. We'll draw some lessons from it, and then make some application concerning our lives today in the 21st century. They lived in challenging times then. It was a matter in which there was great conflict. Moses had served God faithfully. He wasn't perfect, as is true with all of us. None of us are perfect. But now, according to Deuteronomy 34 chronologically, following then on into Joshua. But in Deuteronomy 34, it says, verse 7, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. If you go on over into the book of Joshua, it starts, verse 1 of chapter 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. And the Lord said to him, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, 
Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. We do not have time to read all, but we find it imperative that we drop on down verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto your, their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We love that word success, don't we? We want to be successful. Whether we're talking about a business, whether we're talking about a school system, maybe a, a particular project that we're taking on, or successful as a mother or father, as a parent, as a husband and wife, a spouse relationship, we want to be successful. The opposite of which would be failure. And that, of course, is just antagonistic to everything that we know. I don't want to be a failure. Certainly God's formula here in is found. Concerning that of being strong, being courageous, looking to the word of the Lord, the book of the law, and read and meditate upon it, for therein when you do, not turning to the right, not turning to the left, but you do the commandments of the Lord, you'll be a success. Nothing has changed, has it? as we look at what Joshua was told, and then we can go laterally over to the New Testament and hear time and again various things that we read that are almost parallel, almost exact to what Joshua was told. What a great inspiration it is to know that we have a God of such stability, that we have a God that informs the people of what He desires that we have a God that has equipped us adequately and thoroughly to which we can be successful. But I want us to look, and even as I put together preparation for this lesson, I looked at a lot of different things concerning this great book and the things that we find in these 24 chapters. When we look especially at some of the events that actually transpired, for an example, in Joshua chapter 2, the 12 spies were sent to Jericho. What a great story that is. I mean, the temptation is just great to kind of pause from where we are in our study and camp there for a little while and talk about those 12 spies, what they saw, and the report that 10 of them came back and gave, what the report that, the report that 2 of them came back and gave. And it happened to be who? Joshua and Caleb. They gave that positive report saying, oh, we can take it. Let us go up and possess the land. I know it doesn't matter how tall they are, how many they are. It doesn't matter. We and God, we can do it. We find that in the second chapter. In the fourth chapter, we read about the crossing of Jordan. What a great story that is. And in particular, a part of it that we often do not emphasize is those 12 stones I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but I hope I tweak your interest just enough that later on you'll read, go back and read about those 12 stones found in chapter 4 of Joshua. It's an interesting story. But we go on further in chapter 5 and 6, we read about the capture of Jericho. How, oh, marvelous story. And how God's hand is involved and how God helps them just like He helps us today. Oh, not in the same way. It was a different need then than it is today, but he, he, he's still that same powerful God. And thus when I read about the crossing 
as well as the Jericho, as well as when we can go on down to Achan and his sin in, in chapter 7 and Ai being destroyed in chapter 8 and a lot of other stories that we find as well. We see a loving God, a powerful God, an instructing God, a cautioning and warning God that will not tolerate sin in the camp, will punish the people when they need to be punished, but he doesn't want to, but it's imperative. Ai. Ai was such a small place. The people thought, well, we can go and capture that. I mean, we don't have to send all the people there. We just send a few there. I mean, it's small. We'll... But they found out that God wasn't with them anymore. And God didn't bless them as they really thought that He would. And the reason they found out also was because, quote, there's sin in the camp. Achan had taken of the accursed thing that which God had told all of them not to take. He took it, and he hid it. He knew it was wrong. Hid it in the ground in his tent. I mean, he thought maybe he could hide from God. He thought he could hide it from everybody. A lot of good it was going to do him, buried. But anyway, nevertheless, he took it, he had it, and sin was in the camp. And as a result, they were destroyed by this small number an enemy that they thought was not a problem at all. In this great book, we have a lot of these stories. But go with me back to chapter 1. Now that Moses is dead, Joshua is now being called upon to lead. I want a sizable portion of our time tonight to be spent concerning that transition. And what I believe suggests for our consideration is that Joshua was a good leader, a great leader. He was a successful leader. And some of the qualities that he exhibited could certainly be followed today. And we can learn from it. For an example, we can look at chapter 1 and notice especially the very first verse 10. When it says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying. As we look and see his actions, we're going to see and make some lateral applications to our lives. A good leader, a successful leader, knows how to delegate. Knows how to actually say to others, here are orders that you have. And to his officers, he gave these orders. You see, a, an eldership cannot do everything. Preachers, deacons, teachers, in any of the categories, all of which serve under the eldership, they can't do it all. Not any one of these categories. But when delegation of authority is exhibited and demonstrated, indeed, one can be powerful and accomplish so much more. Joshua commanded the officers, saying, Pass through here, do this particular thing. And thereby, he did not have to be at that place doing all of it himself. Number two, a successful leader, we're going to see in verse 11, prepares for the future. Read with me, verse 11. Pass through the host, command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals. For within three days you shall pass over the Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Prepare you the victuals. You see, whether it's three days, three weeks, three months, three years, or three decades, Preparation, at times, is imperative in order to be successful. And Joshua here is showing the wisdom of advanced planning and preparation, knowing exactly what is to be done, and knowing what is the need of the people. That is the key. To look at and to prepare for the long term. I don't know how long you've been in this building. I know how long we've been at East Hill in that building. I know some other places that I could tell you some stories about that is rather interesting. One church in the Memphis area, for an example. 
and how that they were landlocked and they, were, they had outgrown where they were and were not doing well. And they went out what was almost a country outside of the edge of Memphis at that time and built. And what a wise, visionary move it was at that time. Oh, they didn't know about it. They didn't fully realize it, how much it was going to be until a later time. What about all of the vision that so many elderships have demonstrated as far as evangelistically? Now the preparation was laid, the foundation was laid for future works that would take the gospel literally around the world. I mentioned Gospel Broadcasting Network a moment ago. Brother Barry Gilreath Sr. was the visionary that had the idea to begin with concerning how great it would be if we could broadcast the good news of Jesus Christ into communities by way of cable systems, by way of dish, and by way of a lot of other ways. It takes ideas, but then action coupled with those ideas. Preparation and planning for the Lord. Oh, I can just almost hear somebody say, whoa, let's be careful, let's go slow, let's not go too fast. But you know, when it comes to the work of our Father, when it comes to souls and the value of souls, should there be anything that slows us down, but rather with excitement and joy and a vim and vigor and vitality, a determination of I can, I can, and I'm going to? To be able to know that our life is ever so brief, soon we're going to die at best. No matter how long we live, it's going to be short time. And to make, some, to make absolutely certain that we have done everything that we can to save ourselves and those in our world. It takes planning. It takes preparation. That's what Joshua had. But notice in the third place, verse 13. Read with me. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, the little ones, your cattle shall remain, etc., etc., etc. A successful leader looks to the past. There's a time and a place for looking back and assessing. I'm not talking about living in the past. I'm not talking about staying in the past from the standpoint of our mentality and kind of relishing all these great things that we've done in the past and it's been wonderful. At East Hill, for an example, let me mention, it's back in the 70s. They had a marvelous bus ministry. They had five buses. They were busing in about 300. The normal average attendance was about 550. It was the going thing then. It was a wonderful way of indoctrinating and teaching a lot of children. We have members there to this day who are members of the church, faithful to God because of that work. But we cannot today in 2012 kind of fold our hands, kind of sit back on good intentions, and in essence say, boy, we really did good back then. You see, we'd be neglecting everything now. It was good that we did good then. It's good that we did, we've done a lot of other things since then, but it's more imperative to take inventory and see exactly, reflect on the past, the determination, the faith, the commitment, the work, all of which was involved, and then ap apply it to our day today. And what can we do today to reach the masses, to teach the lost, to bring in the less fortunate, to help comfort them, whatever it may be, as a servant of our master to accomplish his work. Joshua was an individual that looked back to the past. He said, remember Moses. Remember what he said. And then we'll draw from that, as it were, to be able to help us. But notice the next thing that he did. In the following verse, verse 15, he referred to the future. Not only the past, but the future, verse 15, until the Lord have given your brethren rest as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them, then ye shall return into the land of your possession and enjoy it. 
which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. Joshua was one that was able to keep before the people the future, the blessings, the benefits, what we have in store as a result of the promises that God has made to us, what riches we have as a, as a child of God today in the same way. But were it not for that hope, the comfort of the Scriptures that tells us of that mansion, the fact that one day this life is going to end with all of its trials and tribulations and temptations, you see, that keeps us going in the same way that it did them to remind them of the blessings and the benefits the same way it does us. So a successful leader, following Joshua's example, is one that draws from the past but also presses toward the future. But notice in the next place, this leader, successful leader, is one that is followed. He's not a tyrant. He's not a dictator. He's not one that's commanding it and making it and gritting his teeth and saying, you're going to do it and like it or not. No. Look at verses 16 and 17. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest we will do. Whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. When a leader successfully, prayerfully, lovingly, obediently, submissively, humbly, and all the other qualities that go hand in hand with that, leads the people, they will follow. Because they see God in that individual. They see the reason and the glory that is theirs to enjoy one day as long as they keep pressing toward that prize. They understand that indeed we will support, we will be there, we will help. And here's the reasons why. What I want us to do now for an economy of time, let's go over to chapter 24. As I said, I know that I'm battling a, a, a fighting a losing battle as far as the clock is concerned, and being able to cover all of this. But there's two more things that I'd like to accomplish, at least to some degree. Number one, I want to spend a little time here in chapter 24, and then go over into Judges. And then number two, I want to look back at the overall book and show some great, powerful, exciting lessons that are transpiring during this transition of leadership. From Moses to Joshua, the greatness of Joshua's leadership, and some great things that we can learn as a result. Fast forward, chapter 24. We read in the opening verses, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, for their officers. And they presented themselves before God, and Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your, dwell, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Verse 3, And I took your father Abraham. Verse 4, And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Verse 5, I sent Moses also in Aaron. Verse 6, And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. Verse 7, And he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and your eyes have seen what I've done in Egypt. Verse 8, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, and I gave them into your hand, and I destroyed them from before you. Verse 10, But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, for I, so I delivered you out of his hand. Verse 11, And I delivered them into your hand. Verse 12, And I sent the hornet before you. Verse 13, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwelt in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not do ye eat. What a great history lesson thus far. He has them all gathered there, and he's giving them a, a backward, retrospective type of glance, and said, Consider all that God has done for you. 
I mean, evaluate all the blessings that you've had because of an abundant and a gracious and a merciful and, and a, a, a generous Father. But now he comes to the challenge. And he presents for them in verse 14, now, you see, you're not living in the past anymore. God has done this and this and this for you, but you've got to be men of your own stature. You've got to stand up on your own two feet. You've got to make your own decision. You've got to do what God will either be pleased with or reject. Here's what you face. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Fear here is not a word that we're talking about like cowering and kind of jumping back. It's the same type of word that we find in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13 where it admonishes all to fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole of man. He says, fear the Lord. Respect Him. Bow down before Him. Realize that He is the great I Am. He has given you all of these things. He will give you so much more, but you must decide your future. Now, therefore, he says in verse 14, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. I've got to pause again, don't I? You see, if we're students of the Bible, we remember over in John 4, 24, the worshiping of God in spirit and in truth. And how many times throughout the Scripture we are reminded of the importance of doing things right, but doing things sincerely, doing things in spirit, with the right spirit. We want the right object, but we want to do it in the right way as well. It is not just the laborious tediousness of mechanically going through the motions here that Joshua is admonishing. He's not saying, okay, get all of these sacrifices, do this exactly right. No, 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 much more than that. He wants you to fear God, and He wants you to serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Then notice what He says. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. Idolatry was such a problem. As we look to the Old Testament and the almost unimaginable cycles that the people have gone through time and again, they would be oppressed. Nations would have taken them captive, whatever it may be. They would cry out to God, please deliver us. God would hear them, lovingly answer their prayers and their pleas, free them. They would stay right for a while, and then they would go right back into idolatry, into sinful immorality. And then after a period of time, they would cry back out to God for help and deliverance. One of those cycles is in process at this time. And what he's doing is telling them, you must put away these gods. You must make sure you put away the gods which your father served. If we had the time to walk back, backward in history a little bit, we could show you exactly what they were doing. But notice again, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you, if it seems somewhat difficult, if it doesn't really make sense, if this is not right in your idea about serving the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served on the other side or whether the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's the three choices. You can serve as your fathers did. You can serve in the, of the gods of the land in which you're dwelling right now. Oh, but as far as I'm concerned, Joshua is saying, we will serve the Lord. I find it interesting to look at the we there. I, I don't believe that he's just merely talking about himself. I think he's talking about his family. And as a leader, a spiritual leader of the family, he's saying, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to lead my family, just in the same way that we can read in Genesis 18. Remember what God said about Abraham? God said he will command his children. They will be faithful. I know him, and he will do that. 
The same way He is telling us even today concerning Joshua and Joshua's de declaration. What did the people say? How'd they react? Drop on down with me. Verse 16, the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Verse 21, and the people said unto Joshua, oh, we will serve the Lord. Verse 23, now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, incline your heart unto the Lord. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God, will we serve in his voice, will we obey? Sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds so impressive to hear what they actually said about what we're going to do, we're committed to do. I mean, we've made up our minds right now. If you go on down into the latter part of that chapter, the end of the book, verse 31, verse 30, uh, 29 rather, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. But one of the greatest passages that I find in this old book is found in verse 31. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Now, I'm not trying to read into that more than what it says and, and yet at the same time is there not a great lesson there? Joshua was a great leader, a successful leader, as we establish in chapter 1. Here's now Joshua standing and exhorting and pleading with them. You've got three choices. As far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And the people said, we're going to serve the Lord. And then we find in verse 31 where it says they served the Lord, not just during the days of Joshua, but even those that were contemporary with Joshua during the time when they also lived, they remained faithful to God. Wow. Let's get right down where we live today, real fast. If you died today, would your family remain faithful? Would they stay true? Would the influence that you as a father would the influence of you as a husband, would the influence of you as the leader of your home be such to where they would keep on keeping on and have their eyes on the goal more determined than ever now that you were not there anymore with a determination of I want to go and be with him forever with my Lord and say, I hope that would be the case. Chronologically, the book of Judges follows. In fact, you can go on over a couple of pages the way it is in my Bible, and you can get to the second chapter, Judges chapter 2. Notice verse 6. Joshua let the people go, and the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And verse 7 says, almost verbatim to verse 31 in Joshua 24, Verse 7 says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Kind of a re-emphasis, isn't it? They knew what the Lord had done. They recognized that he was in charge. They loved him with all their heart. They were determined to do that, and they did that, even after Joshua died. I wish the story ended there. It doesn't. Read three verses later with me in verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Verse 13, And they forsook the Lord and served Baal. Verse 17, they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them, and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in. Verse 20, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. I'm sure it breaks your heart as it does mine. Here was a people who recognized, understood, loved, and respected, feared God. But then it broke down. There arose a generation that 
were not taught, had not been instructed, had not been reminded of the great things that God had done for them. Here was a generation that they in and of themselves were not responsible. But their parents, those that have gone before, they broke down, they failed, they did not do their job. Do we not hear in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11, teach your children when you're standing, when you're lying, when you're sitting down. Train up a child in the way he should go, Proverbs 22. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6. All of these and so many much more do we find in the Word of God admonishing to eliminate the possibility of this happening. But even in spite of that, I'm not trying to be a doomsday prophet. I'm not trying to be a prophet at all. I'm not trying to, to, to say gloom and despair. But folks, is it not true that we're not as much people of the book as we used to be? We're not Bible-toting, Bible-quoting like we used to be. We're, we're, we're too carried away in this tyranny of the urgent world that we live in. We run from one fire to another to be able to put it all out, doing things that are cool and, and great and wonderful within themselves. Nothing wrong with sports and activities and other things in school and, and academics and all of that is great, but not if it takes us away from the teaching of our children and our grandchildren, that which is most important. I'd rather them not have that degree behind their name and know my God because the degree behind their name they'll leave behind when they draw their last breath. We've got to make sure that we don't raise a generation that does not know God. We've got to put our roots down and make sure there's not a famine in the land. Now, what time does the bell ring? About We got another 30 minutes? Oh, okay, good. I thought so. Man, that's great. All right, let me get back over here to another area. I want us to talk just briefly, and I'll go until the buzzer or that alarm bell or the fire hall or whatever it is that went off a minute ago uh, that I heard. I, I mean, you, you don't miss that bell, do you? But anyway, well, we'll, we'll go to that and we'll hear that. Here we hear some lessons that we learned from Joshua, the book, and some lessons that I believe will help us. Number one, we should always be prepared. Here was a man that had been preparing for a long time, many years. He was a servant, a minister to Moses. He was kind of in the wings. He wasn't a competition. He wasn't trying to outshine him. He wasn't trying to outdo him. He was there to help in any way that he could, but he was prepared and ready to go when the time for him to step to the plate took place. Number two, he was fully and wholly following the Lord. That's what it says about him in various places in the Old Testament. Here was a man that loved God with all of his heart, mind, body, soul. Now Luke chapter 10, verse 27 and following. Here was a man that was truly putting him first, even before himself. Moses, his servant, his master rather, the one that he worked beside, all of which had done the same thing. Remember in Hebrews 11 where Moses chose to suffer the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? Joshua had watched that. Joshua had learned from that. And Joshua now was following the Lord completely. Number three, sin brings serious and desperate consequences. He learned that from Achan, didn't he? During the time in which we can read about that incident that we referred to earlier, it wasn't a matter in which... He got away with it. He didn't. Others didn't know about it, but God did. And we know that for a fact is true with us. In Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. Joshua led his family. He respected holy things. He removed not the ancient landmarks. He recognized that great people were those that loved God with all of his heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. He was patient, and he certainly knew that when God was with you, you could be victorious. That's just a little bit. Read the book. It's an exciting book. The way I say it sometimes, and it's not original with me, but I've heard others, even a, I believe it was a serial commercial one time, read it again as if for the first time. It's exciting and beneficial. Thank you so much for your awesome attention.